morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I hope the Masters has caffeinated you enough to get through the next half an hour to 45 minutes of content. And thank you for Masters for inviting us to the event. My name is Dan Stone. I work as an email strategist at Return Path. I've been in email marketing for about 12 years now. God, it's been a, it's been a long time working for online retail and publishing and then moving across to Return Path to do strategy for them. And I'm Priyanka. Um, I have worked at Return Path for a little bit over seven years, so I know a bit about email. So hopefully, we'll do justice. <laughs> right. Come on. So uh, today, we want to talk about customer centricity in email marketing, the gift that keeps on giving. I'll stand here, apparently. Cool. There we go. So uh, just a bit of an agenda, so what we're going to go through today. But yes, let's go straight into it, to be honest. So the state of email, before we get into uh, customer centricity and everything about it, we wanted to give a bit of a state of email. Obviously, you hear all the stories, email's dead every year, email's dying, but what is the truth? So I love this slide. This was a slide that always entertains me. So this was sort of someone's idea, the path to the inbox. You send your email from your ESP, and then it goes into the NSA. Some scary shit happens to it. The US government gets involved, probably, probably Russia as well, Dracula, the Illuminati, and then it finally lands in the inbox. But the truth is, it's actually more complicated than that. Inbox is actually a battlefield today. So in our uh, content of customer centricity, we are going to talk about three hurdles. One is actually from sent to getting delivered. And that's what's going to be taken care of by your ESP. The second hurdle is to get into the inbox after you got delivered. And the third hurdle is actually staying in the inbox. And that is so much dependent on what your subscribers are feeling about your brand. And that's all we are going to talk about today. Exactly. And I know this looks complicated and scary, but to be honest, email is in a good place. According to e-consultancy, it still produces the strongest ROI compared to any other channel. And uh, the DMA actually produce, uh, produced some interest in documentation that on average, an email address is worth £28 to an organization. So obviously, still in a strong place, it's still a, a key channel in email marketing. So now let's move on to customer centricity, if I could say it. I've got to practice saying centricity. So uh, this is a fantastic uh, diagram by Steve McDonald about all the areas that make up customer centricity and how you, know, you put the customer first at the, at the end of it. It always has to be about customer thought. What does the customer think? And uh, first of all, we want to talk about the metrics that matter. So throughout the presentation, we might be using some words. If you think that we are not clarifying things enough, feel free to ask us questions. And Dan and I will hang out today at the return path stand all day. So come find us as well. Nice shameless plug. <laughs> so hidden metrics. So hidden metrics, what are they? And why do we really want to talk about hidden metrics? So anything that you're not measuring today. So the reason why it's important is as marketers, we all need to see how our subscribers are engaging with us. And we look at your open rates, your click rates, unsubscribes, how are people engaging with the overall email marketing program. But essentially, uh, mailbox providers like Microsoft and Gmail, they don't really care. What they care about is, uh, for example, if brand A sends Dan an email, and if I were Microsoft, all I care about is what is Dan's engagement level with brand A versus all the other brands that are sending emails to Dan's inbox? And that's all I care about. And if Dan is not really engaging with brand A, well, hard luck, Microsoft will filter emails into the junk folder. Mm -hmm. So today, we will invite you to think about um, engagement in terms of a little bit different metrics that you would generally not think about in terms of measuring your performance. And at Return Path, we call them hidden metrics. So what are hidden metrics? So there are some positive hidden metrics. These are like positive triggers that a subscriber can provide to their uh, mailbox providers. So these are like message read, messages replied to if I'm replying to a brand message, or if I'm bringing back emails from the spam folder to the inbox. That's a huge positive trigger but there are negative triggers as well. So for example, messages deleted without reading. I'm unengaged with your brand, so much so 
that I don't even want to engage with anything that your brand has to offer, and I'm deleting your messages without reading them. And as marketers today, I find not a lot of people look into these kind of metrics and try to measure performance. But data always tells a story. And if you look at these metrics, you always almost get a feel of how your subscribers are looking at your email. What are they feeling about your email and your brand? So we will now see some examples as to how Return Path thinks about hidden metrics and hidden metrics in action. So uh, personalization, everyone hears personalization is a fantastic thing, everyone should be doing personalization. I wanted to put it to the actual test and use hidden metrics to prove the worth of personalization in email. So I set up a, a comparison, Netflix versus uh, BFI. Imagine like a street fighter fight, they both fly in with the verses in the middle of it. So uh, let's talk about Netflix. Everyone knows Netflix, very personalized, the app and the website recommend products to you, videos to you all the time that you should be watching based on propensity modeling. Compare that to BFI, a bit more standard, a bit more one size fits all, just general recommendations. But what does the hidden metrics tell us about this? So first of all, you just look at read rates So comparing BFI to uh, Netflix. You can see that BFI ever so slightly have a lower read rate over on average compared to uh, Netflix. Look at what we call the delete here without reading, so more to the customers actually just deleting the email without reading it. You can see if I has more of that happening due to Netflix, because the content might not be as engaging to them as uh, Netflix is. And the funny, the, what we call the MPP mark spam, or this is actually filtering by the inbox, so the ISPs are putting the emails into the spam folder versus the inbox. You can see that uh, BFI have a higher a uh, high rate of this happening compared to Netflix, this will come down to engagement or the way that the emails are being consumed by the customers. And then moving on to forwards, as Priyanka said, forwards is an, another fantastic key, a metric to show engagement and show that brands uh, or customers are engaging with brands. This is an example from uh, uh, Waitrose. They send out an email about cookery and about getting involved with recipe cards and about how just listing all the ingredients to go with it. When we compare the read rates compared to their benchmark average, a few points up, nothing, nothing too different. But when we actually look at the forwarding rates of this, you can see this is dramatically higher. Obviously, with these emails, people are wanted to share it with their friends and family, share like, these recipes that they love. Maybe next time I come around, I want you to make this recipe for me if you want to be a bit cheeky. I do that to my sister, to be honest. I send her a little menu of, I'd like you to make this next time I come around, because I'm not a very good brother, to be honest. But then for mailbox providers, it can be a huge positive trigger that a subscriber not only likes your emails, they want everyone around them to see what you're sending. So that's mm -hmm. a great example, Dan. Yeah, and then when we actually look at the 2018 hidden metrics benchmark, you can see what the, the average was and comparing it to Waitrose, they're a lot higher on these campaigns, just showing just the true engagement of these. So we are talking about hidden metrics and the positive um, aspects of it. This is actually one of my favorite examples from BT. So every Friday, they send an email out, Friday Fix, and they talk about games and events coming up. Um, and it's very consistent every Friday, and it's called a Friday Fix. When we looked at that email and how it was performing, what we found was a lot of people were retrieving these emails from the spam folder back to their inbox. Why? Probably because it's so consistent. I'm waiting to get a Friday Fix email from BT. If I don't see it in my inbox today, I'm going to go to my spam folder to get it. So it kind of gives a positive flag to the mailbox providers that I really want to receive this email. And also a very positive boost to the email reputation that we all talk about. Exactly. So we are talking about positive flags and we need to talk about negative flags as well. So we all remember the panic we had when KFC ran out of chicken. Oh my God, it was crazy. <laughs> um, so what KFC decided to do is send out an, an apology email, which in itself is not bad. Yeah, I mean, an apology email to your subscribers, great. But what happened is the tone of the email probably did not resonate with the subscribers. And it's important, and I'll talk about it a few more seconds about that. But what we saw in our metrics that Mailbox providers marking this uh, message as spam went through the roof. Now the question is why, right? I mean, every time you're testing a strategy, 
think about your audience. Think about, does my audience have appetite to receive or consume this kind of an email? And the second thing, which is quite important, is bad press. So every time, think about every time your brand has a bad press, wherever it is, it could be at your customer service, where people are not really happy with service, or it could be a direct marketing you've sent out with your brand. Every time you're setting those expectations and your subscribers are unhappy with your brand, the easiest way to take it out is via email. Complain on your email or put it in the inbox. Delete them without reading. So things to think about. Mm -hmm, definitely. And then uh, moving on to one of my, uh, my favorite examples is something I wrote a blog post on a while ago. This is uh, Yellow Bulldog. You might guess I'm a bit of a geek. I love all the sci-fi and TV shows and everything. And Yellow Bulldog is a brand I consume quite heavily. They send me lots of interesting T-shirts, lots of interesting offers in my, into my inbox. And you see some example emails from there. And then you might see one that stands out, Darth Vader. So last Christmas, I think it was, out of the blue, I received an email from a brand called Darth Vader. And I did it what every like, consumer was doing. I don't recognize that brand. I don't receive emails from Darth Vader at all. I've never seen one before. So I actually just delete it without reading it. And then the marketer inside me thought, it's a bit weird, you know, I have, I'd like Star Wars, it must be some sort of reason. So I went back and dug it out. And it actually turned out it was Yellow Bulldog had changed their branding, the from name, to try and be clever to tie into the offer that they were sending. But because I didn't recognize that brand anymore, I didn't have the trust with it. And then when we actually looked at the hidden metrics, you can see that that campaign had a higher delete that reading rate compared to their base because other people were similar to me, didn't recognize the brand name anymore, didn't have that trust in that brand. So just deleted it and didn't realize it was actually a very good offer from Yellow Bulldog. And then moving on to uh, actually mailboxes. The mailboxes themselves are actually, say actually a lot, working on uh, helping to unsubscribe. So this is a, a, an example from the Gmail app that uh, if a consumer doesn't open emails from a certain brand within 30 days, then Gmail pop up the tooltip going, you haven't engaged with this brand in a while, would you just like to unsubscribe from this brand? And it's trying to entice them to unsubscribe and get removed emails from the inbox that they're not engaging with anymore. That's a good point, Dan, because we are talking about hidden metrics, and you're thinking, OK, my subscriber has unsubscribed, but what is the core reason why they have done it? And from Mailbox perspective, this is what Yahoo is doing. So if you're deleting emails, like three emails in a row, they are sending a trigger saying, hey, do you really want to be subscribed to this brand? Mm -hmm. And <coughs> chances are, if I'm not, then I would unsubscribe as a subscriber. What you are measuring as marketers is, well, Priyanka has unsubscribed from my brand. Well, why have I done that? What is the core of it? I'm deleting your emails without reading them. So I think I hope you can take away some of the hidden metrics and things to think about, which is a little bit outside of the KPIs, which is open rates and click rates and unsubscribes. Exactly. So just the key takeaways, as we've already said, data always tells a story. Obviously, look at your clicks and your conversions, but other data points to put your customer at the center of everything that you do to understand what your customer is doing. Right. And you know what? Go ahead and have fun with your email campaigns, but always think about your audience. What kind of appetite does your audience have to consume your campaigns? To test everything, do not implement a certain strategy and run with it and implement it for your entire database. Test it and have fun with your content. Exactly. So uh, going back to our fantastic chart, thanks again, Steve, for, uh, for this one. We will now want to look at a few extra points, so designing the experience and understanding the customer. And with that reminds, obviously, the time of year that we're in is just the season. You know, the, the joke that winter is coming, and so is Christmas. You know, there's no, there's, I've got to put a Game of Friends reference in there. I'm really sorry. Had to do it. I was really happy when I came up with this one as well. And, uh, you know, there's no avoiding it. it. It is coming up. So we just want to talk a bit about it. Yeah, and I think one of the most important points people are talking about today is personalization. You can't run away from it. Too much of it is creepy. Too little of it you're making your customers feel that they are not special enough. But start with something in order to personalize, because we have found that every time you give your subscribers a personalized experience, they are more happy with your brand. They are more OK to share some personal information, share something that they wouldn't probably share with brands they are not giving them personalized experience. But don't stop there. You can do a lot of other things. You can segment. You can test out different strategies. Think about creating social sharing and so on. 
So whilst talking about personalization, we need to talk about subject lines as well. Because now it's the holiday season, everyone is gonna send more and more emails every day. And subject lines are quite tough because you're churning out subject lines every day, maybe even four times a day. Think about what you're sending, make it relevant, and make your subscribers feel special with your subject lines. I think one of the most important key takeaways here is the use of emojis. And we see a lot of people trying to use different kind of emojis, but be careful because if every travel vertical starts using a sun and a surf emoji, it's not gonna work because I'm seeing every other subject line with that and what's special about that? And talking about emojis, Dan, mm -hmm. do you wanna share your? Yeah, uh, Pizza Hut used to do some very cool emails where they just did emoji only subject lines. So there was no text snip, just pure emojis and it was quite engaging, quite entertaining with that brand. But I saw other brands jumping on that bag wedding and because it didn't work with their tone of voice, it just lost the meaning and everyone started doing it and it just lost the concept of it, to be honest. And then moving on to timing. So obviously Black Friday, I worked, when I worked at marketing one year, my boss came to me and was like, we're gonna do Black Friday month. Every day we're gonna be sending emails around Black Friday. And I was like, the hell are you talking about? Like, no, Black Friday is one day of the week, one day of the year. It's like, no, no, everyone's gonna love discounts every day for a month. And I was like, you're, cra you're crazy. Like, what, what are you talking about? So I wanted to do some analysis on this. This is actually a French brand and they did a two week Black Friday event and we looked at the, uh, the read rates of their emails going up to it and you can see that they were increasing very nicely coming up to Black Friday and then kind of went off a bit of a cliff at the end. So post event, obviously people are still opening, engaging with them, but not to the same rate. So it just shows each brand is different. Some people might do Black Friday weeks or Black Friday two weeks and it works for them. It comes around to testing and knowing your brand and knowing your customers and again, put them at the center of it to understand what they, what they want and what they accept. And then moving on to gamification, so how to make your emails interesting and eye-catching and engaging. So this is a fantastic example from Ever21. They do a nice like scratch card GIF animation in their emails for Black Friday last year. It was eye-catching, it was fun. People like, had a sense of anticipation, knowing what the final discount was, and if they clicked through, which one they would get, because it was a bit of like a Russian roulette type thing. And they actually built the engagement and built the fun and the, what, the whole point of Black Friday and you know, you know, have some fun with it. I don't know how many times I opened that email because Will the discount change every time I do a scratch card game? Mm -hmm. it, it was quite interesting. Exactly. And then, obviously, talking about Christmas, everyone's doing discounting, product ranges, but that might not necessarily suit your brand and not what your customers want. For example, I'm a massive music fan go. I go to a lot of music festivals. I still have all the wristbands on from all my music festivals. So my friends every year get me Ticketmaster vouchers because they don't know what to buy me for Christmas. So I like a voucher, so when it's time to buy the next Glastonbury ticket, which I sadly didn't get tickets for this year, which I'm a bit sad about. But uh, other events, then I still have the discount ready to go. Or maybe uh, this is a good example from Marks and Spencer. You know, if your mum's anything like mine, she was like, I don't need anything for Christmas. Just don't buy me anything. And I'm like, I can't buy you flowers again for like the fifth year in the row. I need to look like a better son. So when I get in trouble, I can sort of remind you that I got you a very nice gift that one time. So uh, Marks and Spencer do a last minute gift guide. So encouraging people to buy, giving you some ideas. If you're not sure what to buy someone, then here's a list of uh, recommended products. And obviously countdown timers, we talk about countdown timers a lot. I'm sure all of you do as well, but how do you use them in a different way? Coming up to Christmas, maybe have a countdown to the last uh, date you can buy before the last postage date, or you, know, you can only buy, to, if you have to buy by the end of the day, or your parcel won't turn up in time for Christmas. So it's building a sense of urgency, but just doing it a bit slightly different way to the norm. But don't just think about Christmas and Black Friday. There are just so many days you can have fun with your campaigns. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite examples is probably the next one, which is the Asda example. And they did a great Halloween uh, campaign where every time you open the email, it became a bit more uh, spookier. And I got into my email every now and then to check, did it change, did it not? I think this was powered by Kick Dynamic, it was wasn't indeed, it? So yeah. I think those guys are there. <laughs> um, but this was one of my favorite examples. I loved it. I engaged with it a lot. And when we looked at data from our panel, we saw that this particular campaign was well received by a lot of people, and their benchmark performance and when performance of this campaign was way better. So. Think about innovative ways to probably engage your subscribers and not just one or two. Which brings us to Valentine's Day, which is not, it's in February. Now, I'm a kind of person who is gonna probably love 
candies or an evening out or whatever. I'm not necessarily going to think about a bucket of chicken when I'm thinking of Valentine's Day. But that didn't stop KFC from doing a Valentine's Day campaign. It didn't stop Innocent from doing, and they are a smoothie brand. I haven't thought about smoothies as a Valentine's Day gift, but think about a customized label, maybe not too bad. So what I'm inviting you to think about, if your brand is not necessarily a romantic brand or something you haven't thought about, should not stop you from running campaigns to do a Valentine's Day campaign. If KFC can do it, so can you. And don't just stop on the Christmases and Valentine's Day and so on. You can do a lot more with your brand. Yeah, so for example, if you don't have a traditional day that fits your brand, invent your own day. That's exactly a couple of examples here. Mr. Hyde started National Burger Day, which, to be honest, in our office, will ma massive burger nuts. So we will always <laughs> go for a burger, especially if there's a discount involved as well. And who doesn't love a beer? So uh, Beer Hawks started their own side beer Monday where you got 15% off all beer. So it just shows that if you have a brand and you have an idea, you don't have a day that fits it, invent your own day. And there was a couple of good examples from a few years ago. So an American brand called REI, or RE, who are like an outdoor clothing brand, they announced that they were going to close all their stores on Black Friday in one year and actually turn off their website. And they were not going to do any Black Friday promotions at all and give the staff the day off. And, and they're enticing people to go out and enjoy the outside world on Black Friday instead of sitting at home on, your, on the internet trying to buy discounts. And it actually turned into a movement the first year that happened. They saw sales go up a few weeks before Black Friday because people were preparing to go out and enjoy the, the, the non-Black Friday event. And then the year afterwards, they run it again. And all the national parks in America actually jumped on the bag one, uh, bag wagon sorry, and announced that they were going to also give free tickets to everyone that day. So you could go into the national parks on Black Friday, get out there. And they kind of just started their own movement of an anti-Black Friday. We at Return Path, we celebrate the burger days. We go out as a team and have burgers. Groupon did something similar, didn't they? Mm -hmm. They did a Green Friday. So you don't necessarily need to have a seasonality to your campaigns. Imagine or invent something and just kind of have fun with it and make your subscribers feel special. And that's all about customer centricity, uh, putting your customers first. So whenever we talk about all these things, one thing we always, always recommend, prepare for the worst. With the seasonalities coming up, when you want to get too many emails out of the door, um, mistakes happen. You might send out a campaign without a subject line or an offer that you can't commit to. What do you do then? Have an apology campaign ready to go. Have the template, have everything ready to go so that if mistakes do happen, you're not running around at the last minute thinking of creating a campaign and sending it out. You have it already for you to go ahead and send it to your subscribers. Loyal subscribers are also forgiving. So they would always appreciate an apology email coming from the brand. It's OK. People make mistakes. But make sure you're ready and you're not making mistakes on your apology emails at the last minute. Yeah, I have actually a good example on that. So I get a lot of emails from uh, certain email governing bodies. And one time they sent me a, a very nice article with a lot of blog post links in it. None of the links worked. So they sent me an apology email going, we're really sorry, we made a mistake. Here's the actual links. The links still didn't work. So they had to send me a third email. The links finally worked. But somehow, in the rush of trying to get this thing out, they corrected my salutation to Susan and greeted me as Susan, which I wasn't overly happy about. Not sure how that worked. But having said that, prepare for the worst, mm -hmm. because mistakes happen. So one of the most important key takeaways we want to let you think is look back to look forward. What that means is, yes, you're running a campaign of Black Friday or Cyber Monday and so on. It'll be a missed opportunity if you didn't analyze what you did last year. What did you do last year? What were your challenges? What were the mistakes you did? What were the success metrics? And when you have all that data, it will then talk about or it will help you strategize your uh, seasonal campaigns of this year. And if you don't do that, you're not, I mean, you have the data with you. It's your company, it's your brand, it's your successes. It's only then a matter of you know, taking that uh, inspiration from there and then make sure your campaigns reflect that. And also competitive benchmark, obviously look at what your competitors doing, your direct competitors but maybe look at your best in breed, someone you aspire to be to. When I worked for a certain online, tealer, a online retailer a few years ago, we wanted to be the ASOS of our industry, so we copied ASOS as much as possible, honestly ripped it off as much as possible if we could get away with it. 
But just because they're not a direct competitor to us doesn't mean those emails aren't going to the same inboxes that we are. So it's going to still be competition there because brands might in integrate with your brands and also a non-direct competitor. So it's all about thinking outside that box, trying to find some best in breed and trying to see what they're up to. OK. So we want to talk about return path certification. And why do we want to talk about return path certification? So we are talking about customer centricity today. And to talk about customer centricity, let's just go back to that very confusing red slide. It's not even rendering very clearly now. But let's go back to the first, the second hurdle we talked about, that is getting into the inbox. If you don't get into the inbox in the first place, no matter what strategy you think about everything, you put resources with your campaigns and content, your subscribers might not be able to see them for you to then get ROI and get all that good things from your email. So we thought we should talk about certification, something that we do offer. Exactly, so certification coverage, it's the leading whitelist out there. It currently covers about 3.5 billion inboxes across the world. So it's the market leader when we come to whitelisting and helping get you into the inbox. We partner with some big names in the market. Obviously, some logo supper, you will recognize the Yahoo's, the Microsoft's, the AOL's, a lot of providers in the US as well if you're sending into those markets. And we being return path, one thing we do with our data is we analyze that. Whether our customers, which are our end customers, want to see analysis or not, we love to analyze our data just for internal purposes to see what's working, what's not. And so we wanted to compare, is there a performance uplift between certified and non-certified customers we have? And yes, it looks like we do. A certified customer can always get an uplift in inboxes Obviously not everyone, but obviously with our partners. And then the second thing is, with the holiday season coming, we also wanted to analyze, is there any kind of positive impact to being certified? And what we saw is, during holiday season, it could be a busy period, it could not be your busy period, but remember, everyone in the industry is trying to send more and more emails. So whether it is your busy period or not, it kind of stops to matter. But what we found was with certification, your inbox placement was more uniform. It was more stable than customers who's, uh, who were not return path certified. So they had a lot of spikes and down uh, trends with their certification metric. Exactly. And then moving on to migration. So I, I've worked a lot this year helping customers migrate from one ESP to another. It's probably one of the most riskiest things you can do in email marketing. There's so many pitfalls around getting back into the inbox, rebuilding that reputation, and getting the ISPs to recognize you as that certain brand again. And this is an, a live example from a customer. As you can see, before certification, their inbox placement is a fluctuation all over the place. Lots of spike in spam rates. They would get into the spam folder quite a lot while they were warming up their IP. We turned on certification, and you can see immediate uplift that there. It stabilized at quite a high level. And also Radley. So Radley are actually a joint customer between Return Path and Amasis, and a big shout out for, to Amasis for the fantastic work that we did on this project together. Radley got uh, certified recently, and they've actually seen an uplift of about 22% in inbox placement and about 28% in read rate. So it just shows the power certification. Once they're into the inbox, then they can start being customer centric and trend centricity and working to engage their customers more. And don't just take our words for it. I mean, you can log on to Return Path website, go through a little bit of case studies, which all our, most of our clients do, and also testimonials. And I'm a big champion for Return Path certification because it takes away the tension of getting into the inbox in the first place. So when you're thinking about all kinds of things, your content, your segmentation strategy, and all kinds of strategy, one thing you can do is take that tension of getting into the inbox out of the equation altogether. Exactly. So um, I think explore certification is one of my recommendations. Um, but with or without certification, always look into your metrics. What, look at different data sources, because at the end of the day, everyone needs to be customer centric. If you're not providing your subscribers what they really want, what they want to look at, or giving them a good experience, they are not gonna engage with your brand, and that's certain, that's what we have seen. And if they don't engage, it's gonna visibly impact your inbox placements, it's gonna visibly impact your ROI. So think about all the metrics that we spoke about in terms of customer centricity. Exactly. 
So thank you for your time today. And if you have any questions, then put your hands up. We can answer them now. If not, then our stand is just out there, and we're happy to also send the deck to you after this as well.